Our children are precious and we love them and we learn from them and so as I begin um, this message this morning I want to share three stories about children with you and I want to see if they're very short stories I want to see if you can find the common thread that runs through all of these stories the first story is about a little boy who went to dinner with his parents one night to the home at the home of one of their elderly church members friends and after he watched the old man bow his head and speak in a very soft voice, the little boy tapped his mother and said, Mommy, what did Mr. Brian say to his plate? <laughs> to his plate. <laughs> Second story. Five-year-old girl was attending the whole worship service for the, whole, for the first time. Um, she'd been going out to nursery and all, and she was coming back first time being in the whole service. And at one point, the minister said, Let us pray. And the little girl watched and she saw all these people bowing their heads and, 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 and looking intently down and so she tapped her grandmother and, and she said grandma what are they all looking for <laughs> last story seven year old son of a telephone operator you can tell this is an older story a telephone operator was attending a Christian school and in one of his classes his teacher asked the whole class who could who could define prayer and the little boy shot his hand up right away and he said I know he said, prayer is messages sent up at night and on Sunday when the rates are cheaper. <laughs> okay, so what's the common theme? Prayer. More specifically, I think they all illustrate that sometimes we just don't fully understand what prayer is. Now, granted, these stories are all about children, but I'm sure we find them a little bit humorous because there have been times in our own lives when we haven't been fully sure about prayer, how to pray, when to pray, even why to pray. These are topics that we're going to examine over the next several weeks in our Lenten sermon series on prayer. But today I want to begin with the same question that the teacher asked her student. How do we define prayer? Or more to the point, what is prayer? Now, this is going to be a very different sermon today. You're going to interact with me. Some of you are going to be participating by reading scriptures. This is more, really more of a teaching sermon than anything. So to begin with, I want you to, I want you to answer that question. Tell me, what is prayer? Communicating with God. We all agree on that? Do I, giving thanks. Thank you, Ed. Anything else that comes to your mind? Listening. Thank you. Praising God. Asking for help. Meditation. Good. Anything else? Thanking God, yeah. Putting everything, y'all, I don't think I need to do the sermon. Y'all got the answers here. That's great. Good answers. Good answers. And, you know, there are a lot of people down through the ages that have tried to define prayer or to say what prayer is. A lot of theologians, a lot of writers, a lot of pastors consider some of these thoughts that they have on prayer. Max Licato, many of you read his books, has written a book on prayer called Before Amen. And he says this. Prayer is the hand of faith on the handle of your heart. I like that. The hand of faith on the handle of your heart. David Jeremiah is a, is a preacher that many of us have seen on television on Sunday mornings. Maybe you've read some of his books. He says this, and boy, he sums it all up. He says, prayer is the way you defeat the devil, reach the lost, restore a backslider, strengthen the saint, send missionaries out, cure the sick, accomplish the impossible, and know the will of God. He's kind of got it all wrapped up there, doesn't he? 
one of the most beloved preachers of our time, and the great evangelist, Billy Graham, gets right to the point. He says, prayer is simply a two-way conversation between you and God. Theologian, and, and uh, Olivet and myself might be the only ones who know who this is, theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer shares his thoughts on what prayer is and is not. He says, prayer does not mean simply to pour one's heart out. It means rather to find the way to God and to speak with him whether the heart is full or empty. That's important because sometimes I think that when we feel the most empty, we don't think we have anything to bring before God. Even politicians have weighed in. President Abraham Lincoln weighed in on the importance of prayer in his life. He says, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My wisdom and all and that of all about me seemed insufficient for the day. Oh, that our politicians today would say that. And the great preacher and reformer Martin Luther, who John quoted earlier this morning, says, I have often learned more in one prayer than I have been able to glean from much reading and reflection. Prayer is so important. And from our humble ability to define prayer, maybe then we can sum up so far what prayer is. Prayer is conversation, communion, and friendship with God. Prayer is an avenue through which we are introduced to, get to know, and build up our relationship with God. And prayer is an avenue through which we seek God, draw close to God, and engage with God. Now, as I said before, as good as all of these thoughts are, they are merely our own human thoughts. They hit on the point and demonstrate our best ability to define prayer, but as with everything else, to get the full truth on prayer, we should turn to the scriptures, to God's word. I looked up the word prayer in my concordance at home and found that there are 113 passages of scripture that contain the word prayer, and that's just the word prayer. I didn't count up all the ones that had pray, praying, prayers, all the other forms of it. So obviously the scripture has something to teach us about prayer. We know in the Old Testament that prayer was offered by the leaders and the priests on behalf of the people, and it was the main channel of communication between God and his people. But we also know that it changed when Jesus came. And we'll get into that in a few moments. But in the New Testament, Jesus prayed and he modeled prayer prayer and he taught his disciples how to pray and we also know from the new testament that paul often included prayers in his letters to the early churches but what does scripture say how does scripture define prayer how can scripture help us answer our question for today what is prayer and specifically part of jesus's teachings on prayer and fasting and giving to others and the lesson that he is teaching for all three of those topics is really our first point about what prayer is not. Prayer is not showy or to be done simply to prove that we are better than someone else. Prayer is not a performance. If it is, then we have missed the whole intent of prayer that God has for us, which is to commune with him. If we are simply praying to put on a show for others or to make others think that we're some super religious person, then we're going down the wrong road with prayer. Jesus clearly states, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing on the street corners to be seen by men. I want you to hear this, folks. Prayer is not for others to see, but for God to hear. Jesus also tells us that prayer is not to be full of meaningless or empty words. He says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So along with the fact that prayer is not showy, we learn that prayer is not wordy or filled with meaningless words. God doesn't require us to have all the right words when we pray. Isn't that a relief? <laughs> 
In fact, God would really rather that we just come before him and humbly cry out to him with words that come straight from our hearts. Because as Jesus said, God already knows what we need, so we don't have to try to formulate the right words to tell him what we think that we need. I was visiting with Polly Stewart this past week, and every time I see her, I am reminded of how when she used to be able to come to church before her health no longer allowed her to, I would call her when it was her turn to offer the prayers of the people. And I would ask her, Miss Polly, or, or will you have our prayer this morning? And she always replied this way, well, I'd be happy to, but, you know, so many, and she'd go on, she said, so many people think that, that they can't do it, that they don't have the right words to say beautiful prayers. She said, but you know, you can almost hear Polly saying this, you know, prayer is really just talking to God the way that we talk to each other. It's beautiful, isn't it? Well, if Jesus teaches us here what prayer is not, then he also goes on to teach us what prayer is. Listen again to his words. He says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. While prayer is not showy and wordy, Jesus teaches us that prayer is intimate and personal. It's between God and us. Now, I know there are times when we pray with others during worship, in times of crisis, but for the most part, even when we're praying with others, prayer is done between us and God. It's done in solitude. It is intimate. It is a personal encounter between us and God. A couple of weeks ago, I attended with all the other clergy of, the, of our conference a day apart with the bishop. And the theme for that day, and I had already chosen our theme for Lent, but the theme for that day, for that day was prayer. And uh, we began with a time of worship, and as we came in our time of worship to our first opportunity for prayer, I was startled for a moment. I actually thought somebody had passed out, fallen on the floor in the aisle. I was sitting on an end seat, and I thought the person on the opposite side of me had fallen into the floor because I heard this thump, and I could see out of the corner of my eye this figure on the floor. But then I looked, and yeah, I realized he had not fallen. He had moved out of his pew, obviously led by the Spirit, and he was on the floor in a fetal-type position with his hands over his head, and he was praying. It's like he was closing out the rest of the world, and certainly all of the rest of us. Then, later on, in that same service, we had another opportunity for prayer. This time, he didn't move to the floor. He moved to the altar. This is a huge church, St. Luke's in Sanford. And he moved all the way up to the altar. And there was one other person up there in the altar, and I watched them. I know I shouldn't have been, but I watched them. And they, they kept moving closer and closer to each other until it was almost as if they were one. She had her arm around him, and I knew they were praying intently. You know, there were 500 plus of us in that sanctuary that day. But I felt, and I know they did too, as if there was no one there but them and God. That's how prayer is to be. Intimate, personal. Shut the door, Jesus says. Cover your head. Tune out the rest of the world. And come and be with just me. That's one thing that we learn, that prayer is intimate and personal. That's a beautiful story, isn't it? It's one that tells about the call of Samuel. But I think it also teaches us some things about prayer. First, it tells us or teaches us some of what prayer is not. Prayer is not just for adults or for those who are trained or experienced priests or pastors. Samuel was just a young boy who was working for the priest Eli. They're both sleeping one night when God decides he wants to speak to them. But who does God call out to? It is not the priest. It is the young boy. 
Now even Samuel didn't think it was possible that God could be speaking to him, but rather it must be Eli calling him. So three times he ran to Eli, and three times Eli told him to go back to bed, that he hadn't called him. Finally, Eli caught on and realized that it was God calling Samuel and wanting to speak to Samuel and not him. You see, prayer is not just for adults or for those who have the training or ordination. On Ash Wednesday, I took my dad to Swepsonville for the noon Wednesday service. And after it was over, four of us went to lunch together, myself, my dad, their preacher, and a layperson from the church. Well, as the food came to the table, the layperson was sitting across from me, and she gets this big grin on her face, and she says, Hallelujah, with three preachers here today, I know I don't have to pray. <laughs> I should have made her pray. You've heard it, haven't you, Olivet? I have too. Sadly, so many times people think they can't pray. We need to let the pastor do it. <laughs> you know something? Olivet, pastor Olivet and I don't have any special training in prayer. I pray for the most part the same way that I prayed as a child. Pouring out my heart to God. I have no special connection. No more special than any of you. Every one of you can pray. God doesn't require that the prayers come from the priest anymore. Thanks be to God. Jesus saw to that. He tore down that curtain between us and God. And according to the writer of Hebrews, he says, Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, which is Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart of full assurance of faith. Samuel's story teaches us this, that prayer is not just for adults. Children can pray some of the most precious prayers I've ever heard in my life. But Samuel's story also teaches us what prayer is. Listen again to the part of the story when Eli and Samuel finally get that it is God speaking. The Lord came and stood there calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. Recognizing that prayer is for everyone, we learn that the very basic core of prayer is found right here that prayer is both speaking and listening. It's a two-way street, folks. Billy Graham got it right, didn't he? It's a two-way conversation between God and us that requires both speaking and listening. Now, you know, I think Jack said this a few weeks ago. God gave us one mouth and two ears, probably for a reason, because we're pretty good at the speaking part, aren't we? How many times, I, I'll, I'll just say this is me, and you, I bet you're going to agree, but how many times have I said, dear God, please do this and this and this and this, in the name of Jesus, thank you, amen, and I'm off and running. Don't take the time to really listen, to wait. Donna reminded us this morning about how important it is to wait on the Lord, to wait and listen. Think about your relationships with other people. Does a one-sided conversation work? with other people? Are your best friendships one-sided where one person does all the talking? No. In fact, we grow rather tired of that, don't we? And we certainly don't learn anything from one-sided conversations except the thoughts and the opinions of the other person. The same is true with God. If we are the only ones talking, then we are never going to learn what it is that God thinks about the subject. I want to come back to Polly for a minute because she just a phenomenal person and as I was visiting with her this week she shared with me and she's probably told all of you this too how blessed she was to have her father as a very godly influence in her life and she was telling me several times that um, she said whenever I had something that concerned me I would go to my father and he would listen to me without interrupting me and then he would say to me well since you asked my opinion let me tell you what I think and then after sharing his opinion, he would say, now, you've told what you think and I've told what I think, but let's go to God and see what God has to say about it. That's, that's pretty impressive. Two-way conversation between God who listens to us and us who must listen to God. Prayer is both speaking and listening, and it is something that every single one of us can and should do. Throughout his life on earth, Jesus modeled prayer, but he also taught us prayer. 
how to pray, when to pray, what to pray, and what prayer really is. Here in these few verses, Jesus reminds us that prayer is not for our glory, but for God's. He reminds us that prayer is not to accomplish our will, but to be, do, be able to do even greater things than Jesus himself was doing. That is, to be able to do, to know and to do the will of God. So here we learn that prayer is not a selfish list of things that we feel like we just have to have. Rather, prayer is aligning ourselves with God's will and trusting God to provide what's best. Donna, I couldn't believe you were talking this morning so much about this in opening assembly. Evidently, God has a point to make to us today. So important that we understand what prayer is not and what prayer is. You know, Jesus makes a pretty bold promise to us here. He says, I will do whatever you ask. That's dangerous. You don't say that to your children, do you? I'll do whatever you ask. Y'all would like for a parent, parents to do that, right? But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, I will do whatever you ask in my name, which really is translated in my spirit, which is really saying that, we, that Jesus will give us whatever we ask for as long as it's in the same spirit as what Jesus would want or would do. Prayer is an avenue through which we can pour out our hearts to God. Now, don't get me wrong. God wants us to tell him what we need. But we must remember that prayer is ultimately our submission to God's will. Jesus shows us this very clearly in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. That's his need. It would be all of our needs, too, if we were facing what he was facing. Isn't there any way, God, that you can take this cup from me? But he doesn't stop there. He says, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's ultimately what prayer is, isn't it? Coming before God, sharing our hearts, but then taking the time to listen because God knows better than we do what we really need. And so we have to be willing to listen to his will so that we then can surrender to his will and align our own lives with his will so that we, like Jesus, can say, not my will, but thy will be done. Well, we're running out of time. But you know what? We have the rest of the season of Lent to continue uh, fleshing out this wonderful gift called prayer. I encourage you to come and listen each week. But I also encourage you to come and pray on Wednesday nights, on Saturdays. I encourage you to come to the study on the prayers of God down through, God's people down through the ages. But I just encourage you to pray. Pray, remembering that prayer is not showy or wordy, but intimate and personal. Prayer is not just for adults or trained priests and pastors, but for all of us in a childlike faith. And prayer is not a selfish list of what we want, but an aligning of our will with God's will. Prayer is so crucial. I want to close with one more story about an atheist who wrote a book. And his book was all about why not to believe in God. But here's the interesting thing. The day his book came out, he was found kneeling beside his bed saying, Lord, please let my book be a success. <laughs> Prayer, my friends, is for all who believe that when we kneel, we are entering into the presence of the living God who listens, speaks, comforts, guides and directs us. Prayer is friendship with God who loves us oh so much. With all of this said, then how can we not respond by falling to our knees often in that sweet hour of prayer or sweet moment of prayer or sweet day of prayer, whatever we choose. Just pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.